All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, <coughs> my apologies if uh, anybody in here is uh, a little warm, but the child lock on the thermostat is active and it's set to 78. There's not much I can do about it. I'm a little warm. I don't know about everybody else. Okay. Homework two. I assigned that on Friday. Um, I have that it's due on Monday, but there's a good chance I'm going to extend that to Wednesday, depending upon where we get today. Because there's a lot of stuff on that assignment, and I'm not sure that we're going to get there, especially given the fact that um, I'm not going to be here on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, uh, I'm going to be coming back from a, a, a conference I've got to go to, so I'll be in a plane when class is going on. So to be clear, we will not have class on Wednesday. Depending upon where we're getting uh, in class, however, uh, I may extend that deadline to the 5th. You folks in steel have a homework assignment due on the 7th, so that would still give you a, a little bit of time. And the, hum the homework in steel design, you'll probably be able to complete that after today's lecture uh, in there. So. But we still got a little bit of ways to go in here. So. All right, um, I'm just going to get right into it um, uh, with uh, with concrete. So let's sort of take stock for a second of where we're at and where we're headed. So right now, for the past, bless you, for the past little bit, we've been looking at concrete beam behavior, just flexural behavior. Take a concrete beam, bend it. How does it respond as the load gets bigger and bigger and bigger? So. The first stage of concrete behavior is uh, its behavior when it is uncracked. In other words, um, uh, you know, the, the tensile stresses are low enough such that uh, the tensile stress is less than the modulus of rupture, MR, or another way of looking at it is that the bending moment is less than the cracking moment. So when that is the case, the beam behaves exactly as it would in Engineering 216, just sigma equals my over i. Um, and that's fine until you reach the cracking moment. Now remember, what is the cracking moment? The cracking moment is just sigma equals my over i, setting your sigma equal to the modulus of rupture and solving for m. What is the moment required to hit a stress of fr? That's it. So the cracking moment is fr times ig over yt. Uh, IG is your gross moment of inertia, and Y sub T is your distance from the centroid to the extreme tension fiber. So if it's in positive bending, that's the very, 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 very bottom of the section. Okay. Um, now what we did uh, last time is we looked at a really, really basic beam, just a, a rectangular cross section, uh, and we asked ourselves how much moment is required to uh, cause this beam to crack. And so for this particular problem, the, it was subjected to a bending moment of 25 foot kips, and uh, it, it's, uh, uh, if we, when we did the math, we found out that the cracking moment was something like 25.6 foot kips. So it was right there on the edge uh, of cracking. And when we did the stresses, uh, the stress evaluation, our modulus of rupture was something like 474 psi, and our bending stress was 463. So again, pretty close, but not quite there. Now. What made this problem a little more complicated was the fact that because it's not a rectangle, because it's a little bit more of a complex shape, just the computation of IG and YT took a little bit longer. So that was sort of the purpose of example three, just going through and making sure that everybody remembers how to compute the, uh, uh, the, the moment of inertia, where the centroid was, and so on and so forth. And so it might have been a little while since you have done that. So. This, is, this was sort of a big focus of the lecture on Friday, was just, okay, here's our cross-section. Let's just go back to Engineering 216 or to statics, depending upon uh, when you covered that. Um, and then compute the moment of inertia, compute your YC and YT, and then once you get that, go through and just compute bending stresses. Is everybody okay with that? Was that, that reason? Any questions? Okay. Now, um, I just, bless you, I just want to make sure that we are continuing on this path of cracking and making sure that we understand when a beam will crack, when it won't crack, you know, so on and so forth. So example three was uh, all about uncracked behavior and I've got a little bit more to it. So here's the continuation of that example just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So we had this beam and we computed all of its moments of inertia, all its, uh, I have a term, I'll call that term a section property. 
So the section property is, or, or what I mean by that term, a section property, is here's a cross section, so samurai sword or a lightsaber through a beam, and that's what it's looked like. A section property is just a numerical quantity that helps define what that looks like, like its area or its moment of inertia or its centroid or something like that. Those are section properties. So 3A was all about computing those section properties. 3B is a little bit more in a concrete design. Let's say we got 3,000 PSI normal weight concrete. What is the maximum load that the beam can carry before it cracks? Okay. So we'll say it's a 24-foot simply supported beam, uh, and there's the material properties. When will it crack? Okay, and, I, and I have a couple points I want to make about that uh, as well. So let's just sort of uh, dive right into this. So we have, you know, I'll say 3B if we want. So if we're trying to determine when this beam will crack, we probably ought to determine the cracking moment, right? Now, in order to determine the cracking moment, we need three quantities. We need Ig, we need Y sub t, and we need our modulus of rupture. Now, for this beam, we already have Ig and Yt. They're right up there. Ig is about 60,185 inches to the fourth, and Y sub t is 21.19 inches. So we have all of those, so the one thing we need is the modulus of rupture. So let's go ahead and compute that. Modulus of rupture. So we have uh, FC prime, which was given to us as 3 KSI, or 3,000 PSI, however you'd like to write that. Now lambda. Remember, lambda is a factor accounting for lightweight aggregate. Now we're dealing with normal weight concrete on this problem, so lambda is going to be what? One. one. All right, so if lambda is one and FC prime is 3 KSI, Our modulus of rupture, 7.5 7 times lambda times the square root of FC prime, which is 7.5 times 1 times the square root of 3, right? There we go. No, you could say it louder. 3,000. Say it louder. 3,000. Remember, you put in PSI, you get out PSI. So don't mess that up. And the best way of, me of not messing it up is write the little p, write the little s, write the little i, put the dot on the i. Make sure that you write out your units. Okay? So 7.5 times 1 times 3,000 psi is what? Four hundred ten point eight. Four one zero point eight. Got a second on that? And Okay. Thank you. PSI, there you go. Put in PSI, you get out PSI. Now, therefore, we can determine our cracking moment pretty easily as FR IG over YT. And, and here's how I'm going to do that. Okay? So on the top, we've got 410 PSI. Or, sorry, here, let me let me put the decimal point on there. So 410.8. Then we have 60,184.9 inches to the fourth, and then 21.19 inches. Now let me ask you a question. This is a moment, and if I compute this, we've done this before already. If we compute this moment, what are the units going to be? Well, we've got <coughs> inches and pounds, right? It's going to be in inch pounds. Okay. Now, what do we want the units to be in? Foot kips. Now, what was our shortcut? 12,000. 12, okay, so what I'm going to do, and the way I'll write this, is I'm going to multiply this by a fraction, and that fraction is going to be one foot kip is equivalent to 12,000 inch pounds. Okay, so instead of just saying 410 times 60,000 divided by this, I'm going to also divide it by 12,000 and just do it all in one fell swoop. Is everybody okay with that?
they have a number for me. We'll say two decimal places. Keep it simple. 97.23 foot tips. 97, 97.23 foot tips. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. Okay. Now, here's something that's worth mentioning. In part A, how much moment were we putting on the beam? Anybody remember? 80 foot kicks. If you remember in part A, we <coughs> blanketly assumed that the beam was uncracked. Was that a viable assumption in part A? Yeah, yeah because the cracking moment's 97 foot kicks. So this would be a way of verifying whether or not that assumption was valid. If we put like 120 foot kips a moment in part A, your first response would be, well, that, then it's not, it's un, it's cracked. That assumption isn't valid. So. Well, would you, you would definitely go back and make something different? Yes, you would. Okay. And that's, that's what we're going to talk about after this, is how do you handle computational stresses after it's cracked? And so that's going to, that's going to be what comes next. And it's a little wonky, but um, I think you'll, uh, I think you'll appreciate it. All right, so far so good? Okay, so let's make sure we're, we're clear on what we're asking uh, on, on this uh, question, okay? So we have a beam, and the question is, how much load can we put on the beam before the beam cracks? Well, I know that it'll crack at 97.23 foot kips, but how does that translate into applied load, okay? Let's think about the scenario, okay? I'll put my little thought bubble over here. Here's my scenario for this beam. I have a beam that's simply supported, and it's being subjected to a uniformly distributed load. So w, this dimension is L. Now, does anybody remember how long this beam is? 60 inches. Nope. No, how long, no, the span. So, so 24, feet? 24 feet, yes. So from a, a three-dimensional perspective, this is 60 inches right here, but that's the dimension that we're talking about is this, I guess, what is it? Um, that. And that dimension is 24 feet. I think that was, that's not bad. That's about the best you're getting out of me. Good enough. Good enough. All right. So that's the that's the 24 feet. Okay. Now, if I have a simply supported beam subjected to a uniformly distributed load, ignoring everything else, if this is my scenario, what is the maximum bending moment that, that you get right here? What's the maximum bending moment from this scenario? How do you compute that? You just did that on a homework assignment. You asked WL squared over 8. And it, that is because it is a simply supported beam and the load is uniformly distributed. If the load was not uniformly distributed, if it was a point load or a triangular load, that formula would be invalid, right? Okay. Now, where does that maximum moment occur? I'm just pop quizzing you at this point. The mid, mid span, right? So if this is my beam, where would the first crack occur? It occur at mid-span, right? And when would it occur? It would occur when this moment equals that, right? So how about this? I know that if the cracking moment is 97.23 foot kips, and I know that the span length is 24 feet, then wouldn't the load that causes cracking equal this? Just solve for the load, right? Make sense? So
What does that come out of it? One point three five. Do I have a second on that? Now, what are the units? Let's think about this. It's a uniformly distributed load. So, when you had a, a distributed load in structural analysis like this, what would the units be? Pounds per foot or kit per foot? Because we're dealing in kits. Example, but I have a couple of questions I would like to ask you as it relates to your homework assignment. Let me ask a question. This beam will crack when it is subject, if it's 24 foot long and simply supported, this beam will crack when it is subjected to 1.35 kips per foot. My question to you is this. If this beam was sitting right in front of me, could I put 1.35 kips per foot on it? Or is there something else already on it? In other words, is there a load that's already on me? Like it's self-weight? It's self-weight. So let me, let me ask you right this. Could I put 1.35 kips per foot, or would it be 1.35 kips per foot minus its self-weight before it cracks? In other words, this beam already has what? 200 pounds per foot, 300 pounds per foot, however much its self-weight is. So if I'm trying to determine how much load I can put on it before it cracks, I need to subtract out its self-weight, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how do I determine its self-weight? 1.2. No, we're not, we're not factoring right now. It's not the fact. We're not worrying about factoring on this assignment yet. We'll worry about load factoring later. But how do I compute this being self-weight? There's a formula. I showed you a while back. Oh. What's that? Yeah, everyone's like, he told us this. <laughs> if I want to determine the self-weight of a beam, I need two quantities. It's the unit weight of the concrete times the area. Boom. Now, do we have the area computed for this section? Yes. What is it? 624. 624 what? Inches squared. Inches squared. So watch this up here. Okay, so let's check out these units. Okay, so the gross area is 624 square inches. Okay. Now, what's the unit weight of the concrete going to be? Let's assume it's normal weight reinforced concrete. 150. 150 what? Hold on now. Hold on. 150 pounds per cubic foot. Hold on now. We got pounds per cubic foot. We have square inches. So if I want to determine the self weight, it would be... 150 pounds per cubic foot times 624 square inches. There's a problem with that, right? In other words, what I ought to do is convert that square inches into square feet. Now, how do you convert square inches into square feet? Divide by 144 because one square foot is 144 square inches. So what does that come out to be? I'm just curious. <coughs> what is it? 650 pounds per foot. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. Okay. Or 0 0.65 kips per foot. 
kits per foot. Is everybody okay with that? So, the question I asked earlier was, can I put 1.35 kips per foot on top of it, and that'll be the moment it causes cracking? No. It's this minus the load that's already on it. In other words, a beam already has 0.65 kips per foot on it before you even do anything with it. So what's the difference there? 0.7? Did I do that right? Okay, so that 0.7, the, the term that we use for that is what would be the superimposed load. In other words, it already has uh, 0.65 kips per foot. We would need an additional 0.7 kips per foot on top of it before the beam cracks. Does that make sense? So that, that's, that's uh, if you ever hear the term superimposed, that's just on top of what's already there. Does that sound good? So in other words, if I have that beam and I put 0.7 kips per foot, that is the moment that it'll crack. Any questions? Now here, here's the thing. 0.7, that would be the load that causes cracking. But I promise you that that is not the maximum load that a concrete beam can experience. Concrete beams can withstand loads far above and beyond their, their cracking moment. And when you exceed the cracking moment, you get into stage two behavior. Okay? The reason why concrete beams can withstand loads far beyond their cracking moment is because of the steel that you put in there. That's the whole point for the reinforcement is to arrest those cracks. Once the concrete intention cracks, the steel takes over. Okay, So you have another region of behavior. So the second stage of behavior, I'm talk, uh, which I'm referring to as the crack behavior, is any time the applied moment is larger than the cracking moment. And this will continue pretty much, or at least pretty close, until you reach what's called the nominal moment capacity, or in other words, the absolute maximum moment that the beam can withstand before it's gone. Okay, And so that's stage three is when the, uh, the beam reaches MN, its nominal moment capacity. We'll talk about that uh, later. Now, in stage two behavior, the concrete that is in tension has cracked. Okay, so I've got a little image over here, but I kind of want to draw it again just to sort of explain what's going on. So here's my beam. And here's the steel reinforcement inside, and I'm taking that beam and I'm bending it. Okay, and it bends, it bends, it bends, everything's going fine until I crack the concrete. When I crack the concrete, what that means is everything that's in tension is separated. It's no longer resisting load. Here is the beam before, and it's literally been separated. Everything, what I would say, below the neutral axis is experiencing tension. Everything above the neutral axis is experiencing compression, right? So what I'm basically saying is once you exceed the cracking moment, once you exceed the cracking moment, the beam basically turns into this. We have this concrete above the neutral axis that's doing just fine. It's in compression, nothing wrong with that. As for everything below the axis, or below the neutral axis, the only thing that's below the neutral axis that's worth considering is the steel. All that concrete that's in, or that's in tension is gone. In other words, it's cracked, it's literally separated. So here's your cross section, that and that. So far so good? So there's no concrete intention at this point. It's all gone, or it's cracked in half. Okay? Now, here's where things get a little interesting. There's two things that we have to figure out. The first is what that distance is, because it's not half that. Okay? It's not half of that because the section has changed. I'm not looking at just a rectangular beam now. I'm looking at a beam and some steel. So the, where the centroid is has now changed to make sure that we, we achieve equilibrium. And we'll talk about how we compute that uh, here in a little bit. But just to show you, just to be clear, the location of the centroid here and the location of the centroid here are not the same spot. And so that's just something to keep in mind. But what gets a little funkier is what happens here. Okay? Now, 
Up until now, we've just been sort of banking on using this formula. I mean, that's the formula we've been using. The sigma equals my over i. It's the fundamental bending stress equation that every structural engineer knows from day one. And it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Except there is one little issue. Okay? When you learn about this formula and you start to derive it and you start to uh, 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 use it, just not only in Engineering 216, but in, in here and in SEAL design and in any course where you know, you're designing some sort of system subjected to loads, you sort of make an assumption at the beginning uh, that doesn't really become important until situations like now. One of the assumptions that you make in the beginning is that when you use sigma equals my over i, you assume that the beam is made of a single material. In other words, the beam is all wood, or it's all aluminum, or it's all steel, or it's all concrete. Okay? And it's that assumption that makes the math a little easier to do and the formula a little easier to derive. Because that's the thing. We usually, when we're deriving expressions in, in engineering applications, we usually try and keep it as simple as possible. Okay? The problem is, is that we're not dealing with a situation like, with, like that right now. This is not a beam of a single material. This is a beam of two materials, because that's concrete and that's steel. Okay? Now, remember, we call the area of steel A sub S. So A sub S is the total area of all that steel. And I've got three bars here, but it could be 27 bars. It doesn't really matter. I would love to be able to use this formula, because it's the, the, my bread and butter equation. But I cannot use that formula for this beam like this. I can't do it because that's a beam of two materials. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take this and I'm going to transform it into a beam of one material. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to take this area of steel and I'm going to transform it into an equivalent lump of concrete. Now what do I mean by equivalent lump of concrete? I mean a lump of concrete that has an equivalent property. And the property that I'm talking about right now is its area. Now, here's the thing. Steel is a material that is much more stiff than concrete. It's much stiffer. Uh, so much so that if you're talking about traditional steel versus traditional concrete property, let's talk about regular old 4 KSI normal weight concrete. Um, Steel is about eight times stiffer than concrete. Okay? So if you want to replace steel with an equivalent lump of concrete, the idea is that that lump of concrete would have eight times the area. Okay? That's the idea, is that it would have eight times the area. Now, I'm not using the term eight. I replace that with something a little more generic with this term in. Okay? In uh, is what's called the modular ratio. Okay? The modular ratio is basically just a term that expresses the ratio between the stiffness of steel and the stiffness of concrete. Now, how do we compute the stiffness of steel and the stiffness of concrete? Well, we do that through Young's modulus. Remember, what's the Young's modulus for steel? That was a number I was going to have burned in the back of your head by the time you get out of here. The Young's modulus of steel is 29,000 KSI. Now, the Young's modulus of concrete depends, right? And I showed you this formula, or these sets of formulas, a while back. It was either 57,000 square root of FC prime for regular old everyday concrete, but for more, I'd say, exotic concrete mixes, it's 33 times the weight raised to 1.5 times the square root of FC prime. Y'all remember that? So, uh, it, was, it was a few slides back, let me see. It was like in the, the material property section. Boom. So, uh, for normal weight concrete, E sub C is the square root of 57,000 square root of FC prime. And for more exotic mixes, uh, we use the formula above. More often than not, we're going to be using uh, the second formula. Normal weight concrete, so normal applications. So, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this beam. And we're going to ask ourselves, what are the bending stresses uh, computed using the transformed area method. So I've got a concrete strength of 3,000 psi, and I have an applied bending moment of 70 foot kicks. 
Now, we'll probably really quickly breeze through the cracking moment computation, but what you're going to see is that the cracking moment on this beam is something like 27 foot tips, and it's being subjected to 70 foot tips. So it's well above and beyond uh, the moment required to crack it. And then once the beam has cracked, we're then going to start asking ourselves, well, how do we transform this into a, 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 a cross-section of a single material, uh, and how do we handle that? Now, all right. So we're going to go through the um, the cracking stuff pretty quickly. So FC prime three KSI, which is three thousand. PSI. The lambda on this problem, this is normal weight concrete, so we're going to take that to be 1. And it's being subjected to 70 foot hits. Now, like I said, I'm going to do the cracking moment stuff pretty quickly. Just because I think we've done that enough by now that it's, it's pretty, pretty rote at this point. So FR is 7.5 times lambda times the square root of FC prime. So 7.5 times 1 times the square root of, remember, put in PSI, get out PSI. Now, we literally just did this exact calculation on the previous problem. For 3,000 PSI normal weight concrete, we computed F sub R as 410 0.8 PSI. We literally just did that. So I don't I, I think that, that's pretty easy. Now, this is a rectangular beam. So we don't have to go through some exotic you know, tabular computation for the moment of inertia. It's a rectangle. The moment of inertia for the gross section is BH cubed over 12. So 12 inches times 20 inches cubed over 12. So tell me what that, I'm going to have you do that before. Tell me what that comes out. 8,000. 8,000 what? Oh, uh, just inches to the fourth. Yep. Inches to the fourth. Awesome. Do I have a second on that? Yeah, 12 cancel, so 20 cubed. That's 8,000. Now, one thing that, that we've sort of glossed over, but it's kind of important now, I sub G is the gross moment of inertia. What that number is, is a numerical representation of how stiff that shape is flexurally. Okay? What I mean by that is what we're going to do here in a little bit is we're going to compute a new moment of inertia for the section once it has cracked. Okay? Now, I'm curious. If the section has cracked, should the cracked moment of inertia be higher than this or lower than this? I'm asking you. It should be lower. That's exactly right. It's 100% correct. Whenever you compute a cracked moment of inertia, it should be lower than the gross moment of inertia because you're going from an intact beam to a cracked beam. Okay? So I'm telling you that because if you're on an exam or on a homework and you're computing a cracked moment of inertia and you get an answer that's like 12,000, you did something wrong. Okay? That's why I'm telling you that. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. I was really about to use this on the screen. <laughs> it, I, I came close, but it didn't happen. So Y sub T, that's the distance from the centroid to the extreme tensile fiber, and for this beam, that's going to be what? Well. What's that? And what you say? Is it 17? Not 17. For how, where, so the extreme tensile fiber is going to be on the very bottom. Centroid is where? Oh, right here. So how far is that? 10 inches, there you go. So just H over 2. Oh, okay. 
And that is because it is a rectangle. If it's a T-beam or something weird, you got to go through the, the math to do that. So therefore, the cracking moment Don't forget your units. We'll say two. Although it, it really won't matter for, for what we're talking about here. Do I have a second on that? Okay. So here's why it didn't matter. Here's the cracking moment, and there's the moment applied. What can you tell me? Oh, it's cracked. It's cracked, yeah. And so it doesn't really matter if it's 27.39 or 27.4 or 27.38643972368484. The beam is cracked. So because we're well past that. Okay. So. Because we're in cracked mode, we're in stage two. We're definitely in stage two land. Now, in order to handle stage two land, one of the values I'm going to need is that, is a modular ratio. Okay? So before we start dealing with transformed sections, let's look at the modular ratio. Because the modular ratio is going to tell us how we turn that steel into an equivalent lump of concrete. Okay? So modular ratio. We call it a modular ratio because it's the ratio of the moduli of elasticity. So yeah, we're um, we're creative with our naming in structural engineering. So we have this, which is 29,000, and we have this, which is 57,000 square root of FC prime, so 57,000 square root of 3. Waiting for somebody to tell me I'm wrong. There you go. Remember, you put in PSI, get out PSI. So this is going to be a big number. Just don't worry. It's going to be big. Three one two two zero one eight point six. Like that? Yeah. All right. And now, what are the units? You put in psi. You get out PSI. Now, this is in KSI. This is in PSI. How do you go from PSI to KSI? What's that? Divide by 1,000. Divide by 1,000. Now, if I divide by 1,000, all I'm doing is taking this and going 1, 2, 3. And so for what we're about to do, I'm just going to call this 3122 KSI. That is close enough for government. And you're going to see why here in a second. Now, remember how I said that steel was much stiffer than concrete? For this batch of concrete, how much stiffer? Like, what's the ratio? Six times fast, six times stiffer, 12 times stiffer. How would you determine that? <coughs> Divide, exactly. And so, one thing about modular ratio values, it doesn't matter what we're talking about, they're usually taken to be larger than one because it's the stiffer material divided by, I guess, the weaker material. I don't like to use the term strength and weakness here, but maybe stiffer versus flexible. Maybe that's better. So, ooh, in, not in. So, ES, EC. So 
So we're getting about like 9.3, something like that. Do I have a second? Okay. Traditionally, in structural engineering, whenever you have modular ratio values, you always round them to the nearest whole number. That's just common. Hence why I said like the rounding over here didn't really matter all that much. So what we're going to do is we're going to take n to be 9. Okay, that, that's just very typical with how we uh, perform these calcs uh, in, in structural engineering. So far, so good? Okay. Now, here's where it's going to get a little funky. Okay. Now, we've got a transform section that we've got to do. Now, for our purposes, what we need to know right now is N is 9 and AS was 3 square inches. Because okay. this problem had three number nines. Okay? Now, here's our beam. Now, remember this dimension was 12 inches. We had steel here. This was AS. And this dimension was 17 inches. Notice how the overall height of the beam, what was the overall height? 20? Yeah, I don't care about that right now because it's not going to matter. Okay? Because the overall height of the, really the only thing I care about right now is the distance from the top of the beam to where the steel is. Remember, everything on the bottom of the beam is cracked. So I don't really care how tall the beam is because it doesn't really matter anyways. Now what we're going to do is we're going to transform this into the following beam on the right. So I've got everything up top. So maybe we'll, we'll do this. And so this dimension here, we're going to call this X. Okay, that's X. I don't know what X is right now. We're going to figure that out. This is still 12 inches. Right? Now, that lump of steel, I'm going to turn that steel into an equivalent lump of concrete. So if over here it's A sub S, over here, <clears throat> it's A sub S times N. So, in other words, three square inches of steel is equivalent to 27 square inches of concrete. Now I'm drawing it as just this big long rectangle. Uh, it, it's not really a, a, a rectangle, it's sort of a lumped value at that same depth. And so that we just draw it as a long rectangle to sort of illustrate that this is bigger, this is bigger than that. But it has to be at the same depth. So if it's got to be at the same depth, the only thing that makes sense is to just draw it really, really wide. Now, keep in mind, this dimension is still 17 inches. Now, if you're paying attention, tell me what is that dimension. Seventeen minus x. Not x minus seventeen. Seventeen minus x. Remember, seventeen is the bigger dimension minus the, the, the x. It's easy to, to, to get this stuff a, a, a little backwards, especially when we start looking at doubly reinforced sections later. So just just be be aware of that. All right, good. go into this math. Let me ask a question. How do you determine a centroid? Just remind me. Fractional. 
fraction. On the bottom, we have the sum of the areas. And on top, what do we have? Sum of AY or AX, whatever, whatever your term is, right? But let's be clear. What do those terms mean? A is the area of the shape that we're looking at. But what's the distance? What is that X? What do we define that as? It's from our datum to the centroid of that individual shape. Does that make sense? So it's sort of like a moment, right? It's an area times a moment arm. Area times a moment arm. Does that, does that make sense? So I'm going to do the same thing here. Basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum moments about the neutral axis. And the neutral axis just being this blue line here. In other words, where that centroid is. And the reason I'm doing that is because the one thing I don't know about that cross-section is what's x? What is that distance? Now, um, I'm also, because everything's in inches, I'm going to um, just say all units are inches. And I'm going to forego writing these tick marks all over the place. But you'll see. The idea is that by summing moments, what we're saying is that all of the moment contribution above the neutral axis equals the moment contribution below the neutral axis. So let's look above the neutral axis. What is the area of that shape above the neutral axis? 12x. So 12x. Now let me ask you this. How far is it from the neutral axis to the centroid of that shape? No, 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 no. This is seven. I'm not. You, okay, that's a that's a great question. If it was eight and a half, then we would know what x is. Oh, we yeah. don't know what x is. So symbolically, from the neutral axis to that centroid, what is it? X over two, right? Because that's from there to the center of that rectangle. Because remember. This is the centroid right here of that rectangle right there. And from there to there, that's x over 2. So that's x over 2 here. And that equals the moment contribution below the neutral axis. Now, what is the area of the shape below the neutral axis? That's exactly right. What is that? Say it. Did you say that? I heard somebody say it. 27. 27. It's just 27 because, remember, 3 square inches of steel equivalent to 27 square inches of concrete. So this is 27. Now, how far is it from the centroid to the center of that line? We're going to have to stop. Here. Is that the 17 minus x? 17 minus x. Does that make sense? So here's what happens. We break into algebra land. On the left side, we have 12x times x over 2. So that's 6x squared. On the right, remember we got to multiply that out. 27 times 17 is 459 minus 27 times x is 27x. Bring everything all over onto the left. We're getting flashbacks to like eighth grade or. Yes, I am going to make you use the quadratic formula. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. You have to sing it. I'm not going to sing. You don't want to hear me sing anything. No, you really don't. If you if you value the, the use of your eardrums, you don't want to. I've been in middle school. I've been in middle school. Damn. All right. All right. I'm curious. Let's do this real quick and then let's call it. And then, yeah, because we're not going to have time. Which, by the way, remember how I said I was going to move the homework back? We are moving the homework back. So it will be due on Wednesday. 
If we did, if we had finished this example, then we could. But this this was this took a little longer. And I don't want to rush through this because this is kind of important. Now, if you solve a quadratic expression, how many answers do you get? Two. Two. So we'll have an x sub one and an x sub two. No. <laughs> so if you ever wondered, like when you're in eighth grade, who is ever going to use this quadratic formula stuff? Finally, it has a real use. I'm saying, I'm glad I'm actually using this for real stuff. This is for real stuff. And, and it becomes much more real later when we look at the collections. Anybody got an answer for one of them? 6.78. How about the other? Negative 11 points. Negative 11.28. Do I have seconds on these? Yeah. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Whenever you do this type of problem in concrete design, you're usually going to get one positive answer and one negative answer. The negative answer would indicate that the centroid of this beam is above the beam. That doesn't make sense, right? So, one of these answers will always be invalid. So the centroid is 6.78 inches. When we come back on Friday, we're going to continue this to determine that. And when we determine that, what we'll find is that it is far less than this. This is 8,000. I will go ahead and tell you this is like 4,070. So it's almost half is stiff. Once it cracks, the stiffness reduces in half, which would make sense. So. Sound good? All right. Again, I, the homework is not due Monday. It will be due the following Wednesday. I'll see you all on Friday, except for those of you in steel. I'll see you here in a few minutes. That's all I got. Yeah, it's just a